Good evening. This is Gloria Taylor Brown bringing you a gathering of priestesses. We have with us this evening the beautiful Sylvia Braylier, and we also have with us Catherine Ravenwood, our co-host. And uh, we have uh, an hour of conversation coming your way. I have decided these are not interviews, and you know I've, I've kind of looking at the different things that are going on. We were talking about it a little bit. Apparently Mercury has now gone direct, which may explain why it was so easy for me to get on this uh, show tonight. Uh, I don't know whether you're having an easier time or not, but uh, whether you're listening to this on the YouTube or whether you're listening to it uh, in, in, in live, and I see that Teresa and Amarita are on. Thank you for coming and listening to us, and hopefully some more will be showing up shortly. It's um, interesting to um, spend time with technology when technology is not working. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is just bless the gods of technology, bless the gods that the, we will have everything will work absolutely perfectly tonight and we will not have any problems and all of you will be able to come on easily and quickly and let me know if you are interested in putting in a question or a um, comment there is a chat section and you can post a question you can post it directly to me or you can post it to the general population uh, we'll see what happens and uh, it's uh, I I'll see it and we'll try and work it into the conversation. Um, Sylvia's I believe been traveling. I'm not quite sure where all she's been. So uh, I've seen a couple of places flit across here that she's been doing. I know she was just at PantheaCon. She was telling me she was with in a room with 150 heavy, heavy breathers. So. <laughs> So hopefully that she's enjoy enjoyed herself with her travels. Um, as we're moving along, we really want to welcome her and welcome her to, because one of the things I really wanted to have her back on, I had her on with Elisa Starkweather back uh, during the time I did the uh, Telesummit. And I really wanted to have Sylvia back on by herself because she has such a wonderful laugh. And she's so free and sharing with it. So uh, hopefully she will laugh for us and tell us good stories. She's so gorgeous. We love having all these beautiful women that we have on. And it is a delight to have you, Miss Sylvia. And I'd like to welcome you to A Gathering of Priestesses. Oh, it's just great to be here again. So good to be here again. Yeah. So the only question we have that is set in the whole show is uh, what drew you on to the priestess path? Well, I think for me it started, I, I grew up in the Christian church. My father's a minister. I had the good fortune of being raised Christian in a way where the, the emphasis was God, God is love. And that was wonderful. We had wonderful community. But I really, not having divine in an image that I could relate to, like the whole guy in the sky thing kind of kind of threw me off. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I needed to find some kind of way of approaching spirituality that would address me as a woman. And, uh, and as I learned deeper about the goddess, I actually married an Indian man. So I had the good uh, I had the good occasion to be exposed to Hinduism uh, pretty early on because we got married when I was still pretty young. But then I learned about the goddess through Hinduism and then came back around into the Western uh, older uh, iconic uh, representations and personifications of the of the goddess, but the goddess began for me through Indian iconography and Indian deity. So that was um, that was a really helpful passage through for me because the you know the traditions are ancient. It's uh, it's not uh, there's a, there's a many many uh, roads to travel that are easy to step upon uh, because it's right there available to you. So um, and then there were many years where I. Uh, had spiritual groups, so I had uh, like a covens or women's, and it was all women's groups, and mm -hmm. such amazing deep 
and powerful work happened in those groups that really influenced um, the direction that my my own work went and my work with people went because uh, this entry into spirituality that really honored um, the sacredness of nature, the sacredness of the, of the deep feminine um, that allowed for emotion and expression and a kind of depth that I really needed to reach my spiritual experience. So I've been very fortunate to be, you know, set in the right place at the right time for various things. I've always found it fascinating and interesting that just like there is American Chinese food, there is American versions of Hindu goddesses. And they are very different from the, the true Hindu do, uh, goddess and religion. And I know a number of Indian people and, and have had a number of friends that, uh, in fact, lived uh, right upstairs from a devout Indian family for 10 years. And it's, um, you know, in the West, we sort of take um, religion like it's a banquet. And you can take this piece of it and that piece of it or the other piece of it, but you don't have to have the whole thing. Whereas what I found was that the people who were Hindu worshippers of, uh, you know, a particular god or goddess, there was no part of it that they left out. That they were, you know, it was that's the way it was. And it was always funny to me to hear someone's uh, ver Americanized version of the goddesses of, I of India. I have a friend who wants me to do the goddess temples of India. And uh, she is Indian, and I'm not sure that my American tourist would be able to get in t touch with that. Have you found the same? Um, I yes and no, yes and no, because the fact is is that there even in India, there's really in in fact there's no such thing as Hinduism. There's Sanatan Dharma, which has many 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 paths. In Hinduism, the term was actually coined by the British mm -hmm. <laughs> as a way to kind of like, let's put all this stuff into one basket. <laughs> so really, like even in India, like one version will be totally different than another. And sure. so that's true. And I would say that Americans or Westerners in general are a little naive. They take little bits and pieces and turn it into something. And... Um, you know, we all have to start somewhere, you know, but the problem is, is when people start re-disseminating the, in the information incorrectly, that's when I start having some challenges. I did a whole, um, one of my online courses, it's like an advanced chakra study, and inside of it, there's, we work with the, the god and the goddess, the, the, the masculine and feminine aspects of each chakra, the dakini, or the deity of each chakra, and I spent years, um, researching the iconography so like a particular the heart chakra what things is the deity supposed to be holding what are they how are they supposed to what's the position of their body it's like it's it's very elaborate but then when I'd even do my research there would once again from India be five different versions and mm -hmm. at a certain point you gotta pick and choose or it's like okay here is this package of this particular tradition and you're just gonna eat the whole thing this is yours and while that works for a lot of people and has worked for millennia, I think times are changing actually. And while I think there is tremendous value in, you know, dig for the well in one spot, mm -hmm. you know, get some real depth, I do think that we are in a time of relational learning where we can take okay, this makes sense to me, this makes sense to me, this makes sense to me, and they all work together, and this is part of what I'm creating in terms of my own personal paradigm. And people really are crafting their own religion, per se, based on what calls to their heart. And while some may say that's completely heretical, well, then I'm a heretic. <laughs> I'm in! <laughs> Well, I've always, uh, you know, I've want, always wanted to know everything, basically. I mean, there's one of these days I'll figure out how to stop learning, and uh, probably when I die. 
Uh, but I've always wanted to know, you know, in other words, okay, if this is the way it is here, why is it almost identical over here in this culture, but so much different in this culture, even within India or even within, you know, some other country? And so I've always, it's, I mean, comparative religion to me is, you know, fascinating. And uh, it's interesting, whenever I was in high school, we had a comparative cl religion class, and basically they compared the Catholics to the Baptists. And that was what they considered comparative. Uh, so, <laughs> and I got in so much trouble and finally dropped out because I wouldn't. I I said, you know, I'm I'm going to fail this course because I this is not what I consider studying the great religions of the world. Whenever we do one paragraph on Judaism and one paragraph on you know uh, something else and five months on Christianity and its variations. So, you know, I said this is basically a study of Christianity in all its variations and argued with them. But, you know, it is it fascinating to me that there is so many different aspects to, of the goddess. And, you know, we say she's the, the woman of, what, a hundred thousand names and the, and the different faces of the goddess and the different aspects that relate to each person and so that as we draw in the goddess to us we're, it's it's kind of interesting in that who we choose to select I mean there's the sweet and gentle goddesses and then there's those of us who hang out with Sekhmet and Kali and you know so it's um, to me it's fascinating the whole goddess literature and the idea of the divine feminine, and I did a conference on the divine feminine a number of years ago in Sedona, and it's just getting into that information is so juicy to me. And I know there's a lot of your work has been around not only the juiciness of the goddess, but the juiciness of women themselves. And yeah. Yeah, I want to I want to tie back to something you were saying before, which is uh, the comparative religion piece, which for me is really important, and I'll tell you why. Um, so I have, I've also gone on a walk about like what is Hinduism, what is Buddhism, what is paganism, what is Christianity, what is this tradition or that tradition or that you know different uh, sect within things, and coming to the understanding. And what I found is when you go to the mystical aspect of any religion, the practices are different, but basically they're all saying the same things. And what really interests me is what are the commonalities that we share? Because I want to know how can we bring people together? How can we create understanding? So for me, I'm very interested in what is the sweet spots that we share that we can expand out so then create more understanding between different traditions, different peoples, different uh, ways of ex experiencing the divine. And really what I, it comes down to for me is like the, uh, the characteristics that we consider sacred, truthfulness, love, compassion, you know, courage, those are the, those are sort of the touchstones of all people everywhere. Mm -hmm. And when you go back to those touchstones, what else do we share is the, like in every tradition, originally there was a shamanic, shamanic aspect to it. And so for me, that's another foundation. It's like, what are the shared pieces? And um, because I'm trying to figure out how do we harmonize humanity? How do we learn to understand one another and get along? And what are, what are the ways we can speak to each other, even if we have a, a widely varied spiritual belief, and still come to a common cause of planetary survival and the evolving of humanity towards more compassion and, and uh, goodness? Yeah. As a... Um student of the Egyptian pantheon and the Egyptian religions, it's always fascinated me that the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, 
would build uh, temples to gods and goddesses. And then they also allowed, if you wanted to build a temple to an Assyrian god, well, here, here's a place you can build one. Uh, and then whenever the Jews uh, began to build temples, they said, well, here, come build one here. And then when the Muslims started building them, they said, well, here, you build them there. So there's one place that Raven and I, I think have both been to in, in Cairo where there is a, a very, very old Christian church, which is like from the year 100, and it's supposedly where Mary sat under the tree. And there's a Jewish church next door, and there's a Muslim church, across the way. I mean, these are within spitting distance of each other. And all of them are probably built on ancient temples that were there before. But it's the idea that religion not, religion divides, spirituality connects. It's that we have the opportunity to bring together individuals uh, you know, because we're all saying the same thing. Uh, that we're all saying, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, don't hit people, um, don't cut people's heads off, you know, be nice. My mother, every day I walked out the door, she'd tell me, be sweet, be nice. And some days it actually happened. <laughs> We'd be surprised how often. <laughs> yes. Uh, so. But you know, as as we look at this, and as we work with the 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 different pantheons and and the different op, uh, opportunities for study, the thing that I find is it all leads back to a source that is unified, and and that each and every one of us can relate to. Do you find that as well? That's that's my core premise. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm working to figure out ways to um, use that premise and the practices that I've developed that are inclusive to um, find ways to create more harmony in the world and how can I expand that. That's one of the things that, that really interests me and part of that is because I'm, a, I'm devoted to the dark goddess. Mm -hmm. So. Some people hear that and they think, oh, the dark goddess, oh, like, she's dark and gnarly and, you know, death. And no, for me, <laughs> it's like, yes, that's, that's an aspect of the dark goddess. For me, the dark goddess, like, let's take it into the example of, like, the black Madonna. It's about the black Madonna, like, no, no one is left behind. Everyone is shielded under her wings. She is the one who cares for the misfits, the forgotten, the, 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 the disenfranchised, the people who are suffering, who have no one to take care of them. The dark goddess, you know, occludes, surrounds, enfolds, and protects them. And, um, and she has many aspects. You know, you, know, you know, thank goodness that Mary was able to hold some, like the, a flame of the goddess during the time when all the other goddesses' flames had been, the people they had been trying to hide, hide them. She was that one flame that stayed up. But you know, then we we go on and we talk about the other dark, dark goddesses, Lilith and and Kali and Sekhmet, and it's like there in there's one aspecting that's like yes, it's destruction. Things that aren't working right need to be destroyed, and that can be compassionate. Mm -hmm. Destruction is not always uh, horrific because sometimes, like, like well, it's about the destruction of your pain, the destruction of your losings, and then suddenly you can go, "Oh, what a relief! Things are actually okay." So it's like the, the lightness of destruction. But my experience of the dark goddess is sweetness, such a sweetness, particularly if you're devoted to her. <laughs> I'll never forget uh, one time being in the Sekhmet temple. And we were doing an all-night devotional to Sekhmet. And this is the Sekhmet temple in, in Nevada, right? Yes, the Sekhmet temple in Nevada. Because uh, I lived in Las Vegas for eight years and did many many rituals at that temple. And um, But I remember one night, uh, in the middle of the night, walking into the temple while we have the ritual going on out. Uh, and... Um, and just, it's almost like 
suddenly you could see that the statue was smiling. Mm. Smile. <laughs> such a and such a sweetness, such a sweetness of energy. So, um, you know, that is a that's one of the the ironies of the, all the projections on the dark goddess. You know, it's like. Yeah, if you're not on her good side, she's a little dark. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the the idea of um, the darkness and the, that darkness is bad. Um, Egypt was referred to as the black land. Uh, that was the, ter the term al Kemet, which means the black land. And what they meant was that dark, rich soil that things could grow from, yes. but it was it's always it is from the dark that we come we come forth and I think that people who get too tied up in the light sometimes they just lose track of reality and it's difficult for them to to step down to reality and you know that what I was thinking about is Raven was talking about uh, the idea of the tower and I want to let her speak on that subject, but the idea of the tower as a transformative uh, power. Raven? Well, yeah, you know, the Tower of Destruction is one of those cards that people freak out about when they get. Oh my God, no, not that! And I'm in, personally, I'm in a tower year, and started off with my sister dying on the third day of January. And that's, that's a pretty much pull the rug out from underneath you event for me because we were really close. But it's been very interesting because as it went like this, and I, I physically felt everything go like this, at the same time, I thought, you know, bring it on. Just bring it on. Because I am willing to let the things that don't work for me finally get leveled out. Because then I know that when the dust all settles, I'm going to have a clear vision again. And my favorite, one of my favorite, well, I have several favorite tower cards because I actually really like the tower card. One of them that I love is in the uh, Cosmic Tribe deck. And the tower is televisions. And they're all on fire. And so that means we're letting those old programs and those old movies in, in our minds and our lives are burned and destroyed. And the guy fall the people falling off the tower usually have they very often have a blissful look on their face. This guy who's falling off the tower has this very blissful look as all these televisions burn up. And the other one I love is in the Shining Woman deck, Rachel Pollock's deck. And the woman on top of the tower, her hair is standing out like, you know, electrified. She has a lightning bolt in each hand, and she's like, Wah! <laughs> you know, dance that sucker down. And it's that place of knowing that you can only go so far with your, with building things up and up and up. And if they're not serving you, they got to come down because you can't, keep building on a foundation that's not strong. So yeah. I think these times of destruction coming in, although they can be very scary, and, you know, I'm a cancer, so I get freaked out easily, but um, not this time. This year it feels different. And so I'm like, bring it on. I'm ready. So we'll see what happens. But I think going into the darkness is, uh, I think I think Gloria is right. I think people get too focused on the light. And so when you do that, your fears become more stuck in the dark and the closet becomes more full of dark things that you haven't been able haven't been willing to look at until finally that you know they're knocking and on the door and pushing it open so they can come out and I think that when we don't look at those things willingly or often enough that they can be completely overwhelming but the dark is it's where all possibilities come from. All the creation myths start in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And it's out of that dark space, that out of chaos, that form and order come, and light comes out of the darkness. So the darkness is there first. Yeah, what we resist definitely uh, persists. You know, and it's, uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, one of my um, teachers a long time ago, had the uh, quote 
the brighter the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. So if you've got somebody who's saying that they're all light and they're all bright and all this, sometimes you need to keep an eye out for that person because truthfully they have um, you know they have some really dark shadows. And in the spiritual, uh, metaphysical um, goddess community, we found that to be true with some people who've, you know, basically ripped off people and done things they shouldn't do. But, you know, that's that's one way to, you know, to look at yourself is, is, you know, are you going too far down one road or another? Because the idea is to balance. It's the yin-yang. It's the light and the dark. And so... You know, when we're balancing, we're bringing the two together. So anyway, um, moving on. So I wanted to hear your take on that. Well, you know, denial is not just a river in Egypt, as they say. Right. <laughs> so yeah, there's a there. I think it's really important to embrace it. I think that though there is a happy medium because it's one thing to embrace the dark and it but embracing your dark to me you means I'm just gonna run this shit through my mind over and over and over and over and over no that's not productive that is just grinding yourself down in deeper mm -hmm. it's like what is the middle point and what is required for that middle point in my perspective is is um, a compassionate witnessing of the self mm-hmm it's one thing to be thinking a thing, but it's another thing to be thinking or feeling a thing, and that, and being presently and present and uh, really being in witness consciousness with your process, not just running the tapes of it. And I think that's a very important distinction that me, needs to be made because I do believe, just like oh no, things are bad and I'm bad, and blah, 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 like running the tapes, that is not productive. No, it is not. Mm -mm. So 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 what so the the point so I think this is the fine tuning that I think these the, the people that are like light light oh light and fairy dust they need <laughs> it's like it's like some of these people are really afraid that if I take the lid off of this will it completely overwhelm me will I be filled with my rage and will it never end mm -hmm. and so a lot of people are afraid to to take the lid off because what will happen if they really touched it and um, but really really anticipation of a thing is always worse than the doing of it and so people are having a lot of pain in advance which prevents them from advancing you know prevent because it's that fear of what will happen so having having um, environments and a, um, a personal attitude that creates safety and a container for doing that depth work and the darkness work, I believe is very important because then you can get traction. You know, it doesn't always have to be someone else, it can be you, but your container then is that witness consciousness. You're not just spinning off into your upset, but you're breathing into it. You're being conscious with the sensations of it. You're being in loving kindness with yourself about it. If people are in darkness and they're using that opportunity to beat themselves, no, that's not what we're talking about. So it, it's it's so there's there's facing your darkness, but there's also ideal ways that one can go about that that are going to be more effective than others. And this is I want to just segue to something that I see that I want to talk about women's covens about mm -hmm. now. I don't know. Like I was starting to do covens back when we were still like, man, boo, you know. <laughs> There's like more of that going on. Like that was not really my thing. But back in the '80s, early '90s, and maybe before that, um, the emphasis was much more about griping, about like a gripe circle, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't think that's particularly productive either. So. It's like, it's this place where as women, how do we create containers for doing the darkness work that isn't about griping? It's okay to share and share your upset. It's not like totally wrong to complain. That's not what I'm saying. But if we keep it in complaint but not move it to movement and what's next and what are you going to do about it, 
then it just it's just let's grind it in. Let's grind it in some more. Let's just pound it in a little bit more. It's making that distinction between what's forward moving and what is just increasing the upset. Very important. And like how do you move your circles if you have if you're in a woman's circle, how do you move it to more towards productive uh, movement and not just be now it's your turn to gripe. Now it's your turn to gripe. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Yes, ma'am. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah. And and basically, I gave up on women's circles, you know, the so-called women's circles, uh, a long time ago, because I'm not going to listen to somebody complain about the same thing every week. And it's and like, so, you know, if that guy's beating you and you need a divorce, get the divorce. That is, yeah. Raven? Oh, what's that? You were trying to say something and I was speaking over you. Oh, I'm sorry. I was probably speaking over you. I was just saying, I think that um, this kind of activity you're talking about, Sylvia, is also an amazing way that we distract ourselves. And so not only are we grinding it, grinding it, and it's not serving anything, but a lot of people are not, maybe not consciously manipulating it as a distraction to completely avoid going to the next place where they need to go. And when somebody calls them on it, freak out time. Oh my God, now I'm the bad person because I pointed this out. But, I, you know, I think distraction is an enormously... Uh, destructive tool and it's wielded very well <laughs> by many many people yeah. in, across the board I don't care if you're a pagan a Wiccan a Christian I, I don't care I just think distraction is very destructive well I know that you Sylvia you've got a number of different women's uh, groups and circles uh, from the army of good girls to the the uh, the, the, the um, Oh, I just went blank. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, know what I mean. yeah I'll, I'll explain a little bit about how my work is interacting. Mm -hmm. Right now, um, we have, uh, there's one project I'm working on called Army of Good Girls, and right now I'm not, my energy isn't going there as much, but the mm -hmm. intention behind Army of Good Girls is, one, how do we get over our good girl complex, that place where um, we're not really claiming who we are and what we've got to say because we're trying to placate everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's not everybody's problem, but a lot of women, the whole idea that you got to placate and kind of like, you know, kind of play it safe down here in the under, it doesn't serve any of us, you know, and we really have to step up. And then the bigger cause is how do we help women in, uh, particularly in um, places where there's developing countries and women have a hard time of it. Like, how do we help those women and children? How do we bring them up? That really concerns me. And um, as women and as Westerners, we have so much. We have so much to be grateful for. And how can we use our influence and our power to help women who do not have that? Mm -hmm. Not having be our circles all about our own poor little story and our I mean like yes we have to work on that to move forward take care of our own personal research uh, our, our own personal real estate of ourselves how do we how do we do that but even more so how do we take what we're doing and help people who do not have the privilege that we have and I feel it is our responsibility as women of power women who have power because of where they live, because of the color of their skin, because of where they are in society. It's your job to make the world a better place, particularly for people who are suffering. And um, I, I would like to be more effective personally. Like, how can I make even a bigger difference? And um, it's, a, it's a question I ask myself every day. Uh, but really, my, my, my group work is more men and women. I work with both men and women. Mm -hmm. But working with the feminine energy. So I have the Tantric Shamanism Mystery School, which is a way to do energy body verification and uh, purification and also uh, you know, getting your whole system lined up so that you can go out and make changes in the world, not only for yourself but for everyone. 
and the Shamasoma program, which is a practitioner's training program in somatic hypnotherapy. So just like my interest in um, comparative religions and what's the commonality, this healing is whole body healing, healing the emotions, the mind, the spirit, the body, uh, like taking, working on all levels. Because sometimes you'll see or you'll often see people who maybe they're spiritually advanced but what is going on with their lives you know or maybe they're you know maybe they're really physically fit but they're just an asshole you know <laughs> it's like it's like, what? it's like how do we work on all levels and be contiguous top to bottom front to back mind body emotion spirit how do we get into that how do we become a vehicle of wholeness and address all of who we are so that when we can take that wholeness into the world and into our societies and into our cultures to uh, bring about changes. So uh, for me, the personal work is always about like any work that you do affects everything for yourself. But let's also not just say, well, that sounds philosophically good. I'll go with that. But actually, what actions will you do to help others? Uh, we have. Not we have a friend that says, um, will it feed the children? Will it grow corn? Yeah. So, you know, no matter how much you stare at your navel, will it feed the children? Will it grow corn? And uh, another of my uh, mentors was Sandra Ray, and she always said, let your results be your guru. You know, if, you're, if you're, you don't like the results you're getting, then you're probably not doing the right thing. So move on. Get on. Get off of your pity pot. That's one of Raven's phrases. Get off the pity pot. Move forward. Get yourself moving. Do something for somebody else. There's always somebody else you can do something for. You don't have to go out and do a global uh, change. You can do something for somebody nearby. We had Indigo Ronlove on last uh, week. And she's doing a project in Egypt where they're taking uh, trash bags, literally trash bags that are blowing around the desert. And they're turning these trash bags into yarn. And from that, that yarn, they are crocheting bags and um, uh, water bottle bags and other things that can be sold. And these women can have a product that they can sell. And it also cleans up the trash bags. And, you know, it's like, look around you. See what you can do. There's something. There's, I guarantee there's something you can do that will make a difference in other people's lives. Even if it's just, you know, taking food to the next door neighbor who's old and doesn't get out much. Yeah, and, and sometimes, you know, and this is exactly it. Like, every day, what can you do? Maybe it's just that you everyone you interact with you try to interact with loving kindness maybe it's that dollar or that twenty dollars you give to the person on the street it's mm -hmm. like these little things all add up to a big thing they really do and if you can do a big thing great go do it but don't don't you know it's it's funny because there's a lot of people who want to make a difference but they don't know how to activate their courage to do it. Oh, maybe they'll be like, maybe it'll embarrass them if I do this or that, or mm. maybe I don't know enough to help people, or like all the stories we make up about why we can't do it, and that's not like blame, but like sometimes it's like once you begin, the way to do it becomes clear, but you must begin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you just begin, you'll figure out how. You don't ha know, have to know how right from the beginning. Well, it's like they say, you can't outdrive your headlights. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to get started. You just got to go down the road and see what happens. You know, one time years ago, I was living in a very small town, and um, a guy was obviously traveling through, and he walked through this grocery store wearing a kilt. And the old redneck guy watched him walk by and we were all in the line together and the kilt guy went through the line and the redneck guy was behind me and made a really snide remark about it about a guy wearing a skirt right and so I just turned around and explained to him I said you know maybe the guys from I was in a little town in eastern Washington I said well maybe he's from Seattle 
A lot of men are wearing kilts in Seattle, and I explained to him they're called utility kilts, and you know they have all these places for tools, and you know a lot of women think it's real sexy. And we had this long time. I said it doesn't mean he's gay or anything, or even if it did, who cares? Anyway, we have this conversation about kilts. The next thing I know, he and his daughter are talking to me about his daughter had been being bullied in school and had to quit going to school and how this abusive stuff she had been receiving at school had caused such a traumatic effect to her, him, and other people and oh my god this went on for, I mean we had this huge long conversation just because it started off with him making a bullying remark about a guy in a kilt and turns out his daughter had to quit school because of being bullied and we had this long talk about it and then and they found out where I lived and came over and like fixed my car or something like that for me oh I had no idea I, you know you don't know yeah and I don't know what happened with her in school but we had a very long conversation about things that might be done and you don't know how things are gonna like you say you just don't know whether yeah. it's an enlightenment kind of epiphany for somebody or you know uh, indigo uh, she hands out crochet hooks and scissors and says here let's do this or Gloria starts with an idea and 45 shows later mm. But you know, it's interesting. Um, the gentleman I, I can't remember his name, uh, who from pa uh, from Bangladesh, who started um, the idea of microfunding, who has now loaned over a billion dollars in fifteen dollar to forty five dollar loans, and has a repayment rate of ninety eight percent, and he has started millions of businesses where basically he loans somebody just enough money to buy the supplies to get started and what he requires is not that you go out and study business not that you know anything about what you're doing what he requires is you go and get four people that will support you in getting this business started and that's what he requires if they yet you have to have support so, you know, if you feel like you can't do something, go out and find four other people who want to do it too and get them to support you, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, if it's visiting the sick, it's feeding the hungry, it's uh, going to the reservations and giving the kids shoes, I don't care what it is, do something to make the world a better place. If you can't do something to make the world a better place, get off it. Yeah. By the way, yeah. I'm Sekhmet's child, too. <laughs> no surprise there. <laughs> <laughs> the Dalai Lama said, Western women will mm -hmm. change the face of the world. The Dalai Lama mm -hmm. sees how women are the, are the ones who care enough and we're in a place of being resourced and we want to see this change so passionately that you know, um, you know, he believes in us and our ability to 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 step forward and make the changes that need need to be. And sometimes, like we said, they're little changes, they're big changes. But I think believing in ourselves and the capacities that we have is really important. But part of what that takes to believe in ourselves is to be believed in at some point. So I think that those that that is. That's excellent advice he's giving because when we have that support, it makes a big difference. Like for those of us who started modalities, traditions, whatever, it's like the most precious people are the uh, first first responders, or the first people, first uh, but responders is the word, um, first joiners. <laughs> I don't know what yeah. you call it, <laughs> right? Those people are more precious than gold that people say I believe in you I believe in what you're up to I, I, I'm, I'm here to support you and yeah, if you don't have your own it. vision if you don't have your own vision maybe there's somebody else's vision mm -hmm. for help and support and change that you could be the support person and then together you're making something amazing happen so being a part of the wave of social change and a planetary change 
you don't have to be the originator of everything. Not ev it wouldn't work if everybody, yeah, I have to be the original one. No, I'll be the original one. <laughs> no, it, that's okay. You have to have a good idea or someone else has a good idea that you join into. But finding something that inspires you, that you feel passionate about. Because as far as I'm concerned, like, that's what life is for. Life isn't for, well, just go through the grind, just making it along with what, what it moves you, and then move towards it, whatever it is. You know, I think that that's important, whether we're talking about social change or just living the life, the empowered life that you are meant to live. I agree with you, and you know, it's it's strange, but uh, I tell people I can't do this show without Raven. Now, Raven doesn't <laughs> handle the technology. No. She doesn't set it up, but I can't do it without her. She is the person I need on here in order for me to do this show. Now, she can set out sometimes, you know, for sister dies or something tragic happens or she just has a party. I don't care. I've but never sat out for a party. I know you haven't. <laughs> but the truth is I need her to be there. And we do need people to be there, you know, and we need people to be there to support us when we're starting out, man. We have, you know, it's like the baby. When the baby makes the first steps, holding on to mommy's fingers is a big, big stretch, and pretty soon they're running. But for those first few steps, it's really important for them to hang on to something. So, you know, find somebody who will let you hang on for a little bit and let you be, be that support for you. I think that's important. Um, and, you know, I know that uh, Sylvia is far beyond the, you know, the, the first supporters. She's into the thousands of supporters. So, uh, you know, that's, but it's, it's truly important that we have that. And so, anyway, before we get too far along, I do want you to let us know what you're doing now, where you're going from here, uh, what's your next thing that you're you're planning, and uh, how we can help you. Well, I'm really excited because I finally had a revelation yesterday. Something that I it's been bugging me for the last year at least, I've been trying to figure out what is the next book I want to write because literally there's five books that are waiting to be written mm -hmm. and I finally figured out where I absolutely need to go and what I'm really excited about right now is I'm, um, I'm going to be writing the training manual, I, I've written a training manual but a, a one that I can print for my Shama Soma method practitioners training and um, something along the lines of like like a Barbara Brennan hands of light kind of book but it's about this somatic shamanic uh, hypnotherapy you know trance healing work and um, so I'm so excited to know okay this is the trajectory I need to be doing because I have a lot of stories I want to tell from my life I've had a lot of really interesting experiences that I know people are going to want to hear about but I just feel like um, getting this this next book out is uh, where my personal energy is going to go um, in terms of what I got going out in the world um, the Tantric Shamanism Mystery School is starting up again February 28th and this particular iteration is happening in the Bay Area California and uh, it's an incredible odyssey of transformation that I just love to do. Eight days over seven months of time. And it really creates a deep community. And it is that place of creating real support so people can make the changes that they want to make. Because, it, it, you know, while we want to feel like we can do everything ourselves, it's really good to have other people backing us up to give us the, the sense of security or people to bounce off of or hold space when we're when we're in that place where we have to sometimes kind of dissolve ourselves before we can put ourselves back together and having a uh, sacred container to do that work um, helps it to make it more secure so that it's gonna go a little smoother so mm -hmm. I love I love the community aspect of it that means a lot to me creating community because I think that um, no matter how many friends we are people often are very lonely because they only share surface things 
And right. when we're in a, an environment where we can really share our depth, um, it's so meaningful. Um, and then in the summer, uh, late spring to early fall, I'm teaching the Shama Soma program in uh, Massachusetts. So, and I'm moving back to Massachusetts for, for uh, well, I'll be back and forth because I have uh, programs to administrate here, but in California, but, uh, but I'll be in Massachusetts this summer, which I'm thrilled about because I lived and worked in Massachusetts for 40 years before I moved out west. And um, so I'm really excited about being home and being in the land that I love and with um, so many beloveds that I've spent so much time with. Um, so, yeah, those are the two things I've got uh, coming up that I'm uh, kind of getting myself all set for. And, um, yeah, but if, you, if people are interested in any of those things, if you just go to sylviabrolier.com, you can find it or... You know, each things have their own websites too, but that's the main one you can find everything at. So yeah, you you're you're well represented on the web. So <laughs> yeah, um, and you know, I know one thing. Yeah, I'm sure, or I'm pretty sure of one thing. That you're glad you're not back in Massachusetts right now. Uh, well, you are right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I call myself a thermally challenged. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm here because, I'm here specifically because of the cold. But uh, if I had my way of it, I'd still be living in the Northeast. Um, but uh, cold doesn't allow it. So. Yeah, um, I've been in conversation with Sandra Cochran, who's going to be on the show. And uh, she's driving back and forth from her office to her home in whiteout conditions. And I think she's in Framingham. And, uh, you know, I remember the, I remember those winters back there. I don't really want to go back, no matter how much I like the people back there. And I do like the people. Great people. I, I wish you would come to San Diego, Diego and visit, visit them. Huh? What, Raven? I grew up in Wyoming. I went through whiteouts every winter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I don't miss 50 below. <laughs> I don't think anybody misses 50 below. No. <laughs> miss, I love Wyoming, but I don't miss 50 below. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Sylvia, for coming on tonight. And you can find, I'll put uh, on the YouTube link, I'll put your um, website link so they can get in touch with you. And, of course, I thank Raven for being my support and my best friend and oh, my sister. Uh, without her, uh, there is no show. You may not believe it, but there is no show. And uh, the other thing I'd like to, you know, let you know is that I'm delighted that the listeners are coming. I've noticed we're getting a upswing in the the people who are viewing it on YouTube, and I'm appreciate that. And I appreciate you telling your friends about it and letting them know. And even if you, ha you know, I know an hour is a long time, so. Like someone told me, she says, I watch it 15 minutes a day for four days. And then she says, it's really good. I, she says, that's all I got, but I can do it that way. And I said, well, that's fine. She, and she just says she loves it. So I'm, we're getting uh, compliments from all over the world. Um, we've got listeners in South Africa, Australia, Switzerland, uh, Norway, the United States, Canada, uh, Brazil. So and it's growing and I appreciate that and I appreciate your being here next week um, what is next week I just went blank um, I think it's Linnea Weatherstone is going to be on next week uh, I'm gonna check and make sure here uh, I can't remember what we've it's uh, hard to remember the I'm in the process of booking right now for the upcoming uh, time. So if you are some, yes, Lunea Weatherstone will be on next week. And she's a fine artist, a woman who originally start, started as a woman. And uh, she's a writer and a number of books. I have no idea how many books she's got at this point. Uh, and uh, I had to beg her to come on. And she's coming on in the period between finishing one book and starting another one. So uh, we're uh, uh, 
Uh, I'm delighted. I haven't met her. I haven't seen her in years. I uh, last time I saw her was probably 15 years ago. So I'm uh, looking forward to it and spending some time with her and and her, her spending time. So thank you so much tonight, and Miss Sylvia, thank you. You're so beautiful. You're so wonderful, and you so. Cogent with your remarks. I really appreciate that. Well, it's always a joy to be on the show, and um, thank you for the work that you're doing and creating a space for women to come and to to learn, to uh, expand themselves, and to grow with one another, to network. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Raven, for being here tonight. And Raven is the best tarot reader in the world. So if you need to have your tarot read, uh, go to Catherine Ravenwood. That's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N. Someone complained last week because I didn't spell it. Uh, Ravenwood, and uh, you can find her from there, or you can go to kravenwood at yahoo.com and send her an email. She'd be delighted to read for you. And she's she's excellent, uh, really good consultant. Thank you, Gloria. You're welcome. So, thank you all of you for listening tonight. We look forward to seeing you here next week. And if you're on the YouTube uh, channel, please uh, leave a comment. Let us know you were there. And um, you can join the uh, gathering of priestesses on uh, Facebook. It is a closed group. You have to ask to join. But I will prove you, provided you know you're a woman, and most of you know you're not too Republican. No, I'm just kidding. Republicans are welcome too. <sighs> anyway, thank you and good night. Good night.